Mee. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started in just a second. If you could finish filling your plates and your cups and take a seat, that would be great. I'm going to lead by example and turn off my phone. Feel free to do the same so it doesn't interfere with our uh, AV system. We are going to be live streamed. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Matt Levitt. I direct the Institute's Stein Program on Counterterrorism and Intelligence, and this is the latest in our uh, counterterrorism lecture series. Uh, we are very, uh, very fortunate to have today uh, Gilles Capel, uh, who does not need an introduction. He's a professor of political science and sciences po. He has been there. He has done that. And most importantly, as you should have seen from the flyer on your seats, he's the author of the book now translated into English, Terror in France, The Rise of Jihad in the West. I liked the uh, title in, in French better about the hexagon, re referencing the shape of, of, of your country, but it, the translation is fantastic. My copy uh, is on my nightstand, completed, but dog-eared and underlined a little. So this clean copy is the one we'll show here. Highly recommend it to everybody. If you don't believe me, listen to what Gilles has to say, and you will find out for yourself. And we are joined today uh, by uh, my good friend Tammy Wittes. Uh, Tamara is a senior fellow um, at the Brookings Institution. She's a former Deputy Assistant Secretary at the State Department for Near East Affairs. She coordinated U.S. policy and democracy and human rights in the region among a great many other things, someone who also has been there uh, and done that. Uh, Gilles will uh, introduce uh, some of the uh, themes in his book. Um, Tammy and I will each offer some commentary, and then we will open it up uh, to Q&A, which I will moderate. Uh, thank you all for coming again. If you haven't, please turn off your phone. And with no further ado, to discuss terror in France, if you haven't ordered it on your cell phone already, Gilles Capel. Thank you very much, Mike. I, I like this uh, order in cell phone thing because we French don't still know those things. And uh, I always learn a lot from coming to Washington and the Washington Institute, of course. Thank you very much for hosting me today. Thank you to, to Matt and uh, Tamara for uh, chairing uh, this, uh, this panel with me. And I would also like to extend my thanks to uh, my compatriot and uh, your scholar in residence, Fabrice Ballange, who has done so much remarkable work on the geography of the Middle East and who's spent a lot of time intriguing so that you would accept a frog uh, to come today, particularly on this day, which is the first day of our new era because we have a new president since yesterday, who's 39, which is uh, the youngest French chief of state since Napoleon Bonaparte. And when I said that to the BBC the other day, after Brexit, they were sort of panic-stricken, but I said, no, we will, we're civil, we'll manage. And he's now with Mrs. Merkel, as I'm with Winep, so you see we have shared influence. Uh, so, um, I started with this um, Mac uh, President Macron story because during the last, the last debate between him and uh, Mrs. Le Pen, uh, she was uh, all the time sort of attacking on him on terrorism because she thought that it would be a line for her that he was soft on terrorism and uh, that therefore she would, she would win. And then finally he lashed at her and said, well, but you know, uh, jihadists want the extreme right to win. And this has been so uh, since the beginning of this uh, third generation jihadism in, um, 
since uh, Abu Musab al-Suri has uh, posted in line his global Islamic resistance call in January 2005, where he stated that, you know, the multiplication of provocative attacks on European soil, uh, Europe being perceived as the soft underbelly of the West, would lead to retaliation, would lead from the majority, still majority so, uh, population, would uh, lead, uh, would boost, would spur extreme right votes, and that would allow for them to mobilize uh, their uh, co-religionists uh, under the banner of jihad, thinking that, you know, uh, there is no hope in the sort of getting together in European societies which were dominated by racist, xenophobic, and what have you uh, parties. And uh, this, I believe, is one of the key issues in, in the politics of jihadism uh, in, uh, in Europe today. And uh, uh, the, uh, um, for, for Americans, um, this, what happened in Europe over the last years at times looked like, you know, it's something that doesn't concern them because, uh, after all, this issue of so many disenfranchised young Muslims in the banlieues, as you know, this is the only French word that's not understandable without translation. The good old days, it was champagne, parfum, it's <laughs> banlieues, and uh, pronounced with an you know? And uh, the, um, you know, this was an issue which was the, it was, it was an Euro a European thing. It was the sort of the backlash from the post-colonial, uh, not well digested history. And uh, America was not, was not really concerned. America had 9-11, which was a different story, and now Europe has this thing. Now, uh, in order to sort of set the record straight, I think that it's interesting to sort of put in perspective the recent history of uh, jihadism. So not to worry, I only have 20 minutes, so I won't tell you the whole story, but just in a snapshot. And, uh, and then mostly to, to contrast phase two and phase three, the way I see them, and see to what extent, A, on the one hand, I believe from the latest developments in France that uh, the sort of uh, network-based bottom-up jihadists of phase three can be defeated, and they have started to be defeated. Now, CT is on the offensive and not on the defensive anymore. They were unable to take uh, the French president presidential election hostage, as they had hoped. And um, this is clearly an achievement, and this is one of the reasons why Mrs. Le Pen fared uh, not as well as uh, his support, her supporters had hoped, even though she she caught uh, one, one third of the votes, nevertheless. Uh, and, um, but in order to understand how it can be defeated, we have to understand how it works. And how it works is also, it's also a, a good thing to, to compare it with, with uh, the other stages and to put that in, 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 in perspective. So being uh, uh, an old Hegelian, uh, I see in, in jihadism, I said that in Heidelberg the other day, thinking that uh, Hegel was still fashionable there. They had no patience for him. It's only Habermas. So uh, Hegel, they had no idea about him. But so. And uh, but I hope that Winnep is a place where Hegel is still revered. And uh, the um, I believe there's a sort of a dialectics of contemporary jihadism. First phase one, which is the phase of affirmation, as Hegel would said would have said, was a jihad in a, from Afghanistan to Algeria and um, and uh, and Egypt, 1979, 1997. So I I won't make the story of jihad in Afghanistan here because some of you may have implemented it, implemented it. Uh, but the, uh, so after a first decade, uh, which ended in February 1989 with the, uh, the pullout of the Soviet troops from Kabul, which would lead uh, to 11-9, not to be confused with 9-11, that is say the fall of the Berlin Wall, but in the jihadists' views, Definitely 11-9 was the end of the old times, and 9-11 the beginning of the new era of jihad. Then after this first 10 years, you know, you, the jihadism or Sunni, uh, uh, Sunni financed and at the time uh, CIA-backed jihadism against the Soviet had killed two birds with uh, one stone. The Soviet bird, of course, and also the uh, Shia bird because uh, for, for the Gulf, kind of Gulf petro-monarchies, 
the, the challenge from Ayatollah Khomeini was huge. And uh, jihadism, you know, jihad in, in, in Afghanistan was also a means to sort of uh, lit a counter fire against the propagation of, of Shia radicalism under Khomeini that was posturing as, you know, the herald and the champion of the oppressed Muslims in the world. And this is why when I ask my students uh, what happened on the 15th of February 1989, they don't know. Well, most of them were not born at the time, of course. Uh, said it's because you remember the 14th of February. So they look at me in bewilderment to look at their shoes. Suddenly one of the students giggles and says, sir, it was Valentine's Day. I say, you're right. But it was the day of the fatwa. And why was the fatwa on the day before? Because Ayatollah Khomeini stole the media, stole the show, pulled the carpet under the Sunnis, and therefore sort of tried to convince his supporters that he still was, and Muslims at large, that he still was the, the herald and the champion, though the real issue was taking place in the Kabul pullout. And this is interesting, important to remember because this Shia-Sunni competition is still ranging now. And also the issue of sealing the show and winning the media war is extremely important because this was a lesson that bin Laden learned. 9-11 was also mainly an issue of stealing the, the media show. And of course, the attack on, the, on blasphemy uh, still lingers on and we had it uh, with the Charlie Hebdo attack, right? Now, uh, the jihadists and the foreign jihadists, and you know, uh, Mujahideen are the lo were the locals, and uh, myself and some others, we coined the word jihadist at the time using the, uh, the European suffix ist to make a difference with, between foreign fighters and, and local fighters. Uh, the jihadists uh, came back to where they came from, uh, Egypt, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, and other places. And in Algeria and uh, Egypt, they tried to duplicate the Afghan jihad. They failed because they thought, you know, they were the zeitgeist, that they were the ones who had taken down the Soviet Union, uh, but they just forgot, but without Saudi money and uh, stingers, uh, there was not much they could have done. And uh, in Algeria and Egypt particularly, and in Algeria, of course, it's very close to the French because the Algerian jihad flowed into France, stepped over into France, the, um, they, they were incapable of mobilizing the masses. And this is the issue number one. You know, killing people is not difficult, uh, but transforming this uh, killing into political mobilization is difficult. And uh, in Algeria, and particularly if you don't have the stingers in the Saudi money, uh, the, in Algeria and in, in Egypt, they failed. 1997 was the failure, and then the Ben Ladens and the Zawahiris, and Zawahiris is the brains, of course, behind Ben Laden, uh, sort of uh, try to learn the lessons from that. Zawahiri uh, published online this little booklet at the time, Fursan uh, Tahtariyat al Nabi, Knights with a K under the Prophet's banner, saying, okay, uh, we have to shift the focus from the nearby enemy to a faraway enemy. The faraway enemy is America. And we have to strike a blow in America to expose it as a colossus with feet of clay so that the masses won't be afraid and we mobilize under our banner, right? This started with the attacks on the American embassies in Africa in 98, then the coal, then, of course, 9-11. And 9-11 was something, you know, of the era of satellite television when people were still watching TV. It, the, the narrative was the narrative of the Towers of Inferno. And uh, so it would, uh, they, they reminded the lesson from Ayatollah Khomeini that you, the media, media war is half of the war at least, or even more. But maybe it was too much. And you know, as they sent Saudis and others flying in the air, they had no access to the grassroots. And what they thought would be that, you know, the West would send um, boots on the ground in, uh, in uh, wherever, in Afghanistan, in, in Iraq, and that uh, the, uh, this would, uh, would lead to another, a new Vietnam, uh, which did not happen. As you know, uh, the, uh, Iraq being a Shia majority country, and remember when I told you about Shia-Sunni competition uh, a minute ago, uh, therefore, uh, they were the, the jihadists did not make it in Iraq. I mean, they, they were cornered in the, in the Sunni uh, regions, which would later on, during phase three, lead to uh, ISIS or IS. But they failed there again. 
They failed in mobilizing the masses. Still the same problem. So phase two had been the moment of negation, if I may say so, following the Hegelian uh, scheme. And now we come to phase three, which is Aufhebung, the um, overcome, or whatever you say in English, and uh, the dépassement. And uh, this was um, sort of expressed by uh, the 1600 pages in Arabic, so tedious that even myself didn't read it completely. I translated parts of it, but not all, of course, which c was called in, in uh, an English translation the global, uh, the global Islamic Resistance Call, posted by Abu Musab al-Suri, a Syrian uh, engineer, trained partially in France, so you see we still trained foreign leaders, uh, in, um, in January 2005. So what did, what did he state? That, you know, uh, if when Muslims kill Muslims, no one is interested. When America was far away, it is really far and really away. And uh, the right focus was Europe. Europe being in the vicinity of the Middle East and North Africa, of the Muslim world, with the millions of disenfranchised young Muslims, who he thought could be targeted as uh, the soldiers of, the, of, uh, of jihad, and where Salafism was spreading at the time, creating a cultural break in values with European societies. So he, he thought that was an interesting issue. The other important thing was that as opposed to the top-down phenomenon of the sort of uh, Leninist, if I may say so, uh, model of, of bin Laden that looked like a sort of an intelligence model, secret service model, people were trained, rehearsed, and then implemented by the book 9-11. Uh, on the contrary, Suri thought that a sort of bottom-up, network-based, or reticular, as we say in civilized languages, uh, mm -hmm. network would be the way to, um, to, destroy, uh, to destroy the West. And um, uh, intelligence networks did not take it seriously at the time. They thought that, you know, uh, uh, such, such a thing can only happen from the top. And they just missed the Cultural Revolution, the other Cultural Revolution that happened also on Valentine's Day 2005. So you think the Frenchman is crazy, of course, they're all uh, obsessed with Valentine's Day, but so what happened on Valentine's Day 2005? It happened in America, of course. This is the day when uh, YouTube got its license from California. And uh, this is the two melt, melted. And, you know, Suri and, uh, and YouTube, in a way, created uh, the, the network-based jihadism, which was so powerful. And uh, you don't need to, to, to have an event of magnitude such as 9-11 anymore. You just, just stage your misdeeds, kill people, behead hostages film them with a GoPro or your telephone, put them online, and then this created a totally different culture. And I think uh, uh, the uh, intelligence community uh, lagged behind for many years before they understood how it worked. Uh, in, in Europe, um, the, the, the French intelligence groups were, were quite efficient at the time. I mean, they had understood how the second generation jihad functioned. They arrested everybody including the guy because the eavesdropped, they knew the networks, they sent, they knew the, the radical mosque and so on. And they, they arrested Jamel Biral, who was the highest ranking French national in Al-Qaeda from Algerian origin, who was on his way to try to bomb your embassy in Paris. But when all those guys were arrested, they were put in jail. And there the problem began. Because the overcrowded uh, jails in, in Europe and elsewhere in the world were the field for proselytism, the sort of incubator for jihad, the, uh, the, uh, the sort of the Institute for Advanced Jihadist Studies, if I may say so. And uh, then they would, they would address petty delinquents and tell them they could be redeemed only in performing jihad and so on and so forth, the sort of Malcolm X phenomenon, you know, that, that you have in the autobiography when, his, uh, when he turns to... Uh, um, to ideas uh, when he's in jail uh, close to uh, Boston. And, uh, or a Sayyid Qutb for those who are uh, uh, more well acquainted to, to the Middle East phenomenon also. And this, of course, was the, was the big incubator. This incubator would develop in the sort of bottom-up actions as of, uh, as of uh, the 2012-2015. And uh, the first... Uh, sort of action that was taken, that was the most blatant action. It was in France in 2012 when a French Algerian kid by the name of Mohamed Merah 
uh, assassinated uh, French soldiers from Muslim descent, or whom he thought were from Muslim descent. Some of them were Caribbean. They were victims of sort of jihad profiling, if I may say so. And also, uh, also three uh, Jewish uh, young students and their professor in Toulouse in the Ozar Atora school. Uh, and uh, this happened uh, following, on the one hand, Suri's handbook, kill apostates, kill Jews, because in this way you will frighten the apostates. They quote unquote, of course, they will, they will not side with the kuffar, with the infidels, and they will know there is retribution there. And you know, and also targeting Jews who are uh, allied with Israel will widen your appeal to people who are anti-Zionist, but not necessarily uh, Salafi, Salafi jihadist. But simultaneously. This took place on the 19th of March, 2012. So you may believe I'm totally obsessed with dates, but it's interesting because this was the 50th anniversary, by the day, of the implementation of the ceasefire in the Algerian War of Independence from France on the 19th of March, 1962. There are something like 5,000 5, um, streets or road names in France named after 19th of March, 62, because this is the day when the draft came back home, right? And, um, and so, by doing so, Mohamed Merah was restarting the war against France, but on, on its own territory now. You know? And Merah's mother rejoiced publicly and said, I'm so glad that my son brought France, uh, hated France, to its knees. So you see how the sort of retro-colonial backlash, to some extent, also is in a capacity to fuel, to merge, to coalesce with the more modern uh, uh, up-to-date jihadi ideas. I'm not sure the Mera affair was, was dealt with uh, seriously enough. We are still waiting for the trial. It will take place under President Macron, but did not take place under President Hollande. Interestingly, it took uh, place a little more than five years ago, also at the beginning of the presidential campaign, uh, when uh, Sarkozy was beaten by, by Hollande. And then we had, from 2015 to uh, January 2015, with the Charlie Hebdo and the hyperkosher attacks, to uh, the stabbing of Father Jacques Hamel on the 26th of July 2016, we had 239 people who died from jihadi attacks on French soil, uh, including the Bataclan attack, 113 dead in one day, the Nice uh, attack, 86 dead, uh, including 30 people from uh, Muslim descent, and so on and so forth. So, everybody thought at the time that, you know, uh, France was uh, not only under threats, but, you know, was the victim and uh, could not, uh, could not counterattack. Then, from uh, sept early September onwards, things started to change and go the other way around. And um, uh, all attacks but one, uh, one that took place three days before uh, the first round of the election when the policeman was uh, killed on the Champs-Élysées Avenue, uh, all attacks were foiled by, by police. Why was that? For a number of reasons, and I just uh, mentioned a few of them so that we can discuss them at length in the Q&A session. The first one was that I believe that military pressure on the Islamist state was efficient. And uh, that, you know, as they are bombed, droned, and everything, as the borders are sealed with Turkey, this is very important because no one can come and go nowadays. And the, the Bataclan uh, attack was made possible because they crossed the borders at will, right? Uh, this And they're, they're busy saving their neck, so they don't have much time to plot about how to soak uh, France and other uh, European countries in blood. And it's, it's more difficult. Things can still happen, but no such thing as the Bataclan with its magnitude, the, the Merlinbeck uh, uh, hub and everything uh, can now uh, function as it did. So that's one thing. And, um, you know, the, the coordinator of most attacks in 2016 a French-Algerian man called Rashid Qasem, who uh, sentenced to death a number of people, including myself, was finally droned uh, in February by, a, by an American missile. 
And his will was interesting because he said in his will, you know, after he sort of said he was a martyr, so please to go to paradise, said, you know, but things do, are not right in the Islamic State. The leaders are behind, they are not in the front line, and uh, the allotment of resources is not good. Look at me, I've been demoted, and I'm not in charge of soaking the West into blood anymore, and, and so on and so forth. He had uh, engineered a sort of female uh, jihadi attack in September, which uh, petered out uh, because it was uh, very badly planned, but he also was chastised uh, severely in the Islamic State by the most Salafi groups, who said he had exposed female modesty to the hands of filthy kuffar, and therefore he had to be punished for that, you know. So, and when my students and I, who, who monitor the, uh, the, the chats on, um, on the Frank-speaking cyber jihad, uh, and also the people we meet in prison, who talk a lot, uh, are not uh, sort of, uh, they are not very optimistic those days. They would rather say that, you know, the phase of strength, the marhalat al tamkin has passed. Now they're under duress. They're into what they call in Arabic, marhalat al istidaf a phase of weakness, and that they have to deepen their knowledge of the structure, of the scriptures. They have to think uh, and about the next phase. But nowadays they, they are really, the, uh, they haven't um, really made up the challenge. That was the challenge of the first and the second generation, i.e., how to move from violence to the mobilization of the masses. With this, I will end asking for your forgiveness because I was longer than uh, I promised. But as our great President Shihak once said, promises are only binding for those who receive them, which is the quintessence of politics, or at least French politics. And with this, I will like to thank you for listening to me in what I d dare not call a religious silence. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you. It is, uh, it is an incredible treat to be here and very, very difficult to follow Gilles Capel, um, but also a real pleasure to uh, share the stage with somebody whose work I have been reading since I was in graduate school. Uh, despite all of the reading I have done of, of Gilles' writings over the years, I am not a terrorism expert. Uh, and I think the comments uh, I have to offer uh, reflect more questions than answers. So what I'll do is pose those questions in your direction, Jill, and look forward to your response. Um, but let me begin by thanking Jill for writing this book, which provides such a detailed, such a complex, uh, multivariate picture of what has generated this current escalating threat uh, of terror in France. Um, for those of you who have not yet had a chance to delve into it, I think you will find it rich and rewarding. I found it very sobering, but ultimately perhaps offering us some hope. And uh, that's what I want to focus on in my comments, is uh, whether there's hope for the way forward given your diagnosis. Um, it's particularly apt, of course, because this book was published in France just before and here just after what's perhaps the most momentous French presidential election in the last several decades. Um, and so the question is whether it offers us an opportunity to move beyond some of the political arguments that have consumed not only France, but Europe and the United States over the last few years and proceed to a, a different kind of conversation. And Gilles' analysis of what gave rise to phase three jihadi terror is um, the interplay between internal societal factors in France and external international forces and movements Internally, there's generational change. There are the attempts and successes and failures of assimilation. There's changing social norms and expectations. Externally, there's all the things he just mentioned in his remarks. Uh, and 
as well the, the, the condition of war and state collapse in the Middle East. And in this way, Gilles writes, there's the simultaneous rise inside France of two discourses that feed off one another, uh, the fascosphere and the jihadosphere. Um, and that, I think, uh, is very sobering and a cautionary tale for France, for Europe, for the United States, uh, that these two discourses are have been feeding off one another and are feeding off one another uh, in very destructive ways. Um, now, here's my question about the opportunity. For the last several years, uh, Europe has been suffused with this debate over European, over European integration, uh, just as we here in the United States have been suffused by a debate over globalization and regional integration and the failings of those processes, the people who have been left out and left behind or disadvantaged by those processes. This debate has reshaped politics, uh, both in Europe and, and here at home. Uh, and the fierce resurgence of right-wing politics uh, and the push to pull back from those processes of integration, um, these things have gained force. The Brexit referendum was evidence that European integration had failed in certain ways to address the needs of European citizens, that the way decisions were being made in Brussels was too far removed, too unilateral. Um, and the US election outcome was seen as evidence as well that globalization was facing a backlash here. And the social forces generated by globalization on the one hand and its failings on the other have catalyzed forms of group identity that are exclusionary at their core, that take a zero-sum approach to politics and economics and are therefore particularly challenging to the premises of liberal democracy. Both liberal democracy's emphasis on individualism rather than group identity and its emphasis on political compromise and free market as mechanisms that produce win-win outcomes. Uh, Gilles engages these issues in the book, uh, although they're not his main subject. They are the context uh, that creates the demand signal for this phase three jihadism. Um, and now we've had in the last few months, several elections in Europe that have essentially pivoted around the question of open or closed. Uh, the question driven by this debate over globalization and its discontents. And in Austria and in the Netherlands and most recently in France, we've seen voters ultimately reject a political platform that in the name of economic welfare and security seeks to roll back integration, to close borders, to shield societies from the effects of globalization. Um, Macron in France is the latest victor over this exclusionary platform. And it's striking to me that his approach to these quest this question of open or close, this question that's been at the heart of Europe's political debate, his answer is decidedly pro-openness. Uh, and so we have to ask, what does this mean? What does this electoral outcome suggest? Can Europeans now finally set aside a question about integration that is framed as yes or no, and instead begin to talk about, if we were to put it in Clintonian terms, mend it, don't end it? Uh, and what does mend it mean, particularly for the subject of Gilles' book? Because taking seriously the rich analysis he provides of what generated this phase three jihadi terror threat means accepting that there is both a supply side and a demand side to this terrorism problem in France, that Economic and political reforms are necessary to overcome the isolation and exclusion both of working class Le Pen supporters and of French Muslims who are now listening to Salafi preachers and are vulnerable to jihadi recruiters. 
And it means embracing that the terror problem in France cannot be separated from the terror problem in Europe. Now, let me stop for a moment and emphasize I am in no way equating Le Pen supporters and those listening to Salafi preachers, but these are the two opposing forces in Gilles analysis, and so I bring them to the fore. Um, so can Macron take what we would call a mend it, don't end it approach to European integration in a way that will meaningfully alter the political and social context that gave rise to phase three? Uh, and then, and on that, I think we've heard a bit from him over the course of the campaign about the approach he would take. The question is whether those policy proposals will succeed. Where we have not heard much from the new president of France is what he'll do on the supply side. We've heard support for the war against ISIS in Syria and Iraq, uh, but exactly what form that takes, uh, what role France intends to play under President Macron, and where else that war on terror may take France. Uh, these questions are still, I think, quite open. And to me, uh, the opportunity uh, that Gilles' analysis presents uh, demands answers to those questions. I very much hope those answers will be positive and constructive, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Never a good idea to volunteer to go last after two brilliant speakers, but, but here's to it. Um, this book uh, is, has been long in the making and long, long needed. And the reason is because, and you might have picked this up from Gilles' presentation, dates matter. Details matter. Perspective, facts, context matters. And it's this which Gilles maps out in a way that officials had not for many years, certainly living these issues at the time. And Jill takes us by the hand and walks us through the events, predating 2005, the 2005 watershed of both the riots in the suburbs of Paris and the publication in January of Abu Musab al-Suri's um, study on the global Islamic resistance call, and takes us through with, to be fair, Monday morning quarterbacking 2020 vision in hindsight, but through things that were not seen uh, at the time. And he's on to something. You know you're on to something when, when the bad guys start issuing death threats against you. Uh, in June of 2016, you may recall, uh, La Rosia Bala murdered a police officer and his wife in a town west of Paris and delivered this kind of macabre speech on Facebook Live. Uh, another new way to use uh, um, social network media uh, with the couple's three-year-old child cowering nearby uh, calling for the death of public figures. And, and the names of those, those figures were, were kept quiet by the press for some time, but uh, Gilles gets a call saying, congratulations, if I understand, you weren't at the top, but you were somewhere in the middle of the list. You're no, at the top no, of no, our no, list. No, I was on the top. You were in the top. Okay. All right. Very good. At least they know where Later, to put you. Later, I was demoted. But, uh. Uh -huh. um, now, as it happens, you know, the Washington Institute does trips to the Middle East all the time. But as it happens, just a few days later, I think it was about a week, maybe two weeks later, also in June 2016, uh, my colleague Mike Singh and I led the Institute's first uh, trip uh, to Europe, focused on all the transatlantic issues that we were trying, tra transatlantic cooperation, all the key Middle East issues that we had going on at the time from the Iran deal to international terrorism to the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, uh, et cetera. And I recall at the time sitting with a very senior uh, French official with our group. Uh, this, by the way, was during the week of the Brexit vote. We started in London, uh, and we, uh, we uh, went through Paris and ended. Uh, uh, I remember having uh, dinner Thursday night with some European counterterrorism officials, including uh, British uh, officials uh, in Brussels the, the night of the, the Brexit vote. I remember being told by a senior French official, quote, 2015 was a terrible year for terrorism in France, right? You remember the attacks uh, in January in particular, and we fear the worst is yet to come. 
we were told multiple times in multiple meetings that you need to understand the perspective. During the Afghan Jihad, there were approximately, we were told, 100 French foreign fighters. And so far today, as of our meeting with them at the time, approximately 2,000 French foreign fighters. Inspired homegrown violent extremists, mostly out of the suburbs, also people who were enabled or directed, and you've heard much about the inspired, enabled, directed uh, continuum from the Islamic State. And the bottom line is authorities around the world, but particularly in France, are overwhelmed by the numbers. And only now are they beginning to see the links between current cases, individuals, and networks, and networks that they came across in the past. Gilles documents at length, for example, one particular park in Paris where a bunch of people were, would meet in, in the mid-2000s to radicalize and recruit and help facilitate the travel of aspiring jihadists to fight in Iraq. And it was out of this very network several years later, which was shut down in 2005, that critical year that Gilles points to, 2005, that then came back to circle around um, 10 years later in 2015. I remember at the time getting asked over and over by uh, reporters in the media in particular, how can you possibly have the Kuachi brothers who carried out the attack on Charlie Hebdo and were claimed by uh, al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula cooperating with Ahmed Koulibaly who produced his own uh, little video uh, self-proclaiming affiliation with the Islamic State isn't al-Qaeda and the Islamic State at war with one another, how could they possibly cooperate here? And the answer in part is that they knew each other well because they went back to that same park 10 years ago. And the other thing that Jill points to very, very well in case that comes up again and again and again is that not just were these relationships built in those original networks, but then in prison. Much stronger networks, much larger networks. One of the critical things to take away today is a question of when we are trying people for these crimes, what are we trying to achieve? And what type of sentences make sense? When you have al-Qaeda and Islamic State terrorists who are caught, prosecuted, and incarcerated for terrorism offenses, and they're given sentences of three years, of four years, if you want to go crazy in the European context, eight to 10 years, what does that mean? Should those sentences be longer? And what should we be doing while they're in prison and for the post-prison probationary period? Because right now we're not doing very much, not here in the United States and not in Europe, a little bit more in Europe, to deal with the fact that we're not dealing with people who are going to be living in prison uh, forever. Jill has an incredible chapter. They're all incredible chapters. But an incredible chapter in particular on the case of Mohammed Mera from 2012, who he writes correctly was seen at the time as kind of a homegrown violent extremist because no one bothered to look at the people that he had met in prison and the people that his uh, brother was in touch with and others, again, in one instance, going back to that, to that same part. Um, I remember writing a piece at the time of the uh, Toulouse attack, the Mohammed Mera attack, and I, I started the piece by harking back to a previous Washington Institute trip. Uh, we were doing at the time our first in what has now been a series of three uh, counter-radicalization or countering violent extremism studies. Uh, at the time, we were doing one of these very, very large uh, bipartisan groups with senior members of Congress. And there was a lot of herding of cats to get people to agree to this comma and that preposition, and we took one senior McCain and one senior Obama official during the campaign uh, to Europe, uh, and we asked the embassy to help us set up a meeting with French officials on counter-radicalization. And we were told in the first instance that will never happen. Why will that never happen? Because the French do not want to talk about this. This is, this is a third rail, and you can't get French officials to talk about it. But we pressed, and because we had senior officials from both campaigns, we ultimately secured a meeting. And we get to this meeting, and before we walk in, as we walk in, we see that the other people in the meeting, these various French officials, are not only greeting one another, but introducing themselves. 
to one another. And it quickly becomes clear they've never met. We have our meeting, which was very interesting. Uh, some people contradicted themselves. They were clearly in the process of thinking these things through. When the meeting ended, we got up to leave, and none of our hosts got up. And they kind of smiled and blanched and said, well, congratulations. The Washington Institute for Near East Policy has now convened the first ever French interagency meeting on counter-radicalization. Their words, not mine. And it was amazing to look now, four years later, as I was writing right after the Mohamed Mera attack in Toulouse, at how little had been achieved in the four years in between. And if you look at where we are today, there's been a lot of movement. Some experimentation has been more successful than others. I do give the Europeans credit for experimenting. We don't have much of a culture of experimentation uh, without risk in this country, and I think it's slowed down our ability to develop smart counter-radicalization um, programs. If you talk to uh, Congress, there's a real, not illegitimate, a real concern. How am I going to know if this program is going to work? And there's a little bit of a need to kind of put in place some programs that have good prospects and that can then be measured and evaluated with metrics, and then we'll have some data to work with. Otherwise, it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg. If you look at the things that have happened since 2005, since our 2008 visit, since the 2012 attack in Toulouse, a lot of things happened that enabled the explosion in jihadist terrorism in Europe and the world to, to occur in ways that might not have otherwise. And Gilles documents these as well. The development of social networking and other online platforms, this, uh, I believe he, he referenced it even in his remarks, this networked-based jihadism. I would add to that, by the way, the issue of encryption, which has made it very, very hard for us to be able to pay attention to the things we need to pay attention to, uh, sometimes at all and certainly in real time. The upheavals of the Arab Spring, which both presented a tremendous challenge to al-Qaeda, Right? Remember, al-Qaeda said that uh, the Egyptian pharaoh, the subject of Gilles' first book, would never be overthrown but by force. And here a bunch of teenagers with cell phones did just that, creating an opening for an alternative jihadist group. And, of course, also the fact that we lost key counterterrorism partners in key places. Um, the Islamist extremist ideology, and Gilles gets into that in detail in terms specifically of Salafism, and the conditions he writes about, in particular in France, of social dysfunction, uh, these disenfranchised uh, suburbs and failed integration. Something that most people say is something that happens over there in Europe and it's very, very different in the United States and which I would agree with, with some exceptions. And that leads to some questions. Is Islam to blame? Right? Um, there are parallels here to the debate and discussion uh, here about what type of language we should be using. I, for one, took the previous administration to task for being uncomfortable using terms like Islamism or jihadism. And I'm equally uncomfortable today when we don't use terms like Islamist, which refers to an ideology in the name of a religion, rather than Islamic, which to me references, and I think grammatically references, a religion, its adherents, and its institutions. I don't think the issue is with all of Islam, and I think we should be careful in saying that and still be careful not to not call a spade a spade. We should. Are counter-radicalization lessons applicable across the spectrum of different types of extremist ideologies? This is a very, very current question. To me, the answer is sometimes and sometimes not. But you will frequently have people who say they always are and they always are not. And finally, is nonviolent Islamist extremism an incubator for is Islamist terrorism? This is a question that Gilles raises very adeptly uh, in the book. And he concludes with the idea that we have to be careful. We have to be strong, we have to be smart, we have to be proactive, and we still should not overreact. There is this risk of falling into the trap of our adversaries when they are trying to rip our societies apart, and they are trying to turn us against one another. I'm reminded again of some of the things that happened after the 2008 attack in Toulouse, after the Mohamed Merah attack, when Sarkozy, who was then running for re-election and ultimately lost, did things like instead of taking issue and contesting the radical Islamist uh, content online, he proposed a law that would enable you to criminalize anybody who went, visited those websites. 
which I think would be exactly the backwards way to do things. At the end of the day, and Tammy said this very well, there are both internal and external factors. There are social, economic, and political conditions, and there are extremists, in this case, Islamist extremist ideologies that we have to contend with. One of the differences between the United States and much of Europe is that we don't criminalize those ideas. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't contest them. That we absolutely must do. So with that, we'll open it up to questions and answers. Uh, we have plenty of time. I'll take you as I see you. We'll start here in the front with Rafi, and we'll make our way around. Uh, and if you'd like, Jill, to incorporate into any of your answers anything that Tammy uh, uh, raised, you should please uh, feel free to do so. You can tell us Macron's foreign policy. Thank you. I, I'm Rafi Danziger, an advisor to APAC. And I haven't had the privilege of reading your book yet. And you may very well answer this in your book. But the question is, aren't we already into uh, a jihadism 4.0? in the sense that today you have situation where you don't need any organization, you don't need any money. Somebody gets up in the morning, gets into his truck and kills people. I think the best illustration of that was a case in Israel where a guy uh, actually slashed three people to death with a knife. And he said to the investigators afterwards, I got up in the morning, didn't even think of doing anything. Then I went to the kitchen in Tel Aviv and I saw a big knife, so I took the knife and killed people. And what can you do in terms of uh, intelligence or any kind of counterterrorism activity when you have such situations? It's enough to have somebody out of millions of people who is inspired by, those, uh, the, by the incitement. And so what do you do about this? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, should I, thank you very much. Uh, sh I, sh could I also um, answer uh, some of the questions raised by Please. Tamara? And yourself? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and I'll get back to your uh, question later. Uh, well, thank you very much for your uh, very kind remarks uh, on my uh, book and presentation. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled, of course. Uh, the, uh, uh, for Tamara, uh, one of the things you mentioned, that is how I try to, to deal with the interplay between internal or domestic issues and external, uh, something I forgot to say in the, in the enthusiasm of the other talk was that one issue which was very important uh, right from in the um, interim, if I may, may say, between Merah and uh, Charlie Hebdo was uh, the Arab upheaval, of course because uh, Merah had not gone to Syria for training. He went to Afghanistan for a very brief of time. He went many places, which is a strange. Uh, th the trial will have to, to find out how he went there. It's not very clear. But anyway, uh, the Arab upheavals created a huge amount of, of battlefield, jihad battlefield zones very close to Europe, starting with Tunisia, uh, southern Tunisia, Libya, the Sahel, where we have boots on the ground, as you know, and when, where the French stopped the uh, jihadi offensive that would have overrun Mali. Um, uh, Sinai, uh, Yemen, and so on and so forth. And uh, so this upheaval was, uh, you know, because it opened up possibilities for a number of people to go there originally, so they claim, for humanitarian reasons. And a number of European governments, including the French government, started to lash out at Bashar al-Assad, who, uh, who was a monster and that he should be downed, and so on and so forth. And therefore, it sort of gave to all those, uh, a number of those young people, the sort of feeling that they were blessed, even by the state, to go there and fight him, that they were having international brigades of sorts, if you want, right? Except that they were uh, Islamic. And that created a, a very impressive opening for, for those to go into jihadism. And I believe that this was, this was not uh, a, an issue that was understood correctly at the time. Um, and this is, this is, of course, uh, important. Now, um, in terms of um, uh, closed and open societies, um, Definitely, uh, um, 
the, the, the election of, uh, of Macron was something that was sort of counterclimatic after what happened in the US and after the Brexit. And this is what boosted Mrs. Le Pen because she thought it would be her. But you always, already in, uh, in the Netherlands, in March, they had elections. Everybody expected Gert Wilders to, to make a landslide, and it did not really happen, though they have a complex uh, political system. Nevertheless, you know, there is a significant rise. I mean, 33% of the votes for Mrs. Le Pen is, is huge. It's one-third of the, of the, of the electorates, of those, those who voted, and one-quarter of the electors did not take part in the vote or uh, put uh, an invalid bulletin in, uh, in the booth. So... Uh, uh, this shows that you know those people who are uh, who are out, who uh, who uh, did not benefit from globalization, who feel dispossessed, uh, are a very uh, significant amount of of the European citizens today, and they may feel dispossessed because their jobs have been outsourced, because they, you know, uh, their jobs have gone to to Poland or to China or whatever, and. Uh, this, of course, feeds into uh, the Le Pen vote. And if you look at the map of the parts of France where um, the Le Pen vote was higher, is corresponds to what I think you would call the Rust Belt in America, right? Uh, but this Rust Belt has not been fixed. Uh, among other things, because the school system uh, today does not produce uh, people who are able to cope with I would not say the post-industrial, but the digital uh, economy, and this is a major and this is a major issue, which is felt both by uh, you know the the aborigine, uh, aboriginous French, if I may say so, and uh, and also by the children of immigrants, uh, where uh, the you know the fact that the parents, the father was on un, was unemployed for so long that. The education system the, the, and the family environment did not, was not echoed and not work well, has led to the fact that you know in some values uh, um, we have something of 40 40 percent unemployment, and if you either you do drugs or you're on welfare, and this of course is not great to make you feel that you're part and parcel of the values of French society that laicite is what you see as your, as your future, right? So. Uh, this parallelism in terms of, you know, the estrangement of people who vote for the extreme right and for Salafism is something uh, which I believe led to the, the congruence of those two phenomena that uh, look at each other like uh, uh, cocks in a, in a, in a, in a cockfight. And um, actually, uh, when the French edition of this book was published in December 9, uh, 2015, right after the Bataclan, uh, one of the journalists, uh, an anchor, a radio morning, a morning radio, uh, very popular um, anchor, asked me what Gilles said. You, you know, said what uh, the, the French, uh, the National Front, and the Salafists are one and the same. It's exactly say no, not exactly. There are congruences. He, I'm not sure he knew what the word meant. And and uh, and Marine Le Pen was listening to this show, and she was furious. And so she started to tweet like crazy uh, photographs of beheaded hostages of ISIS in their orange suit, including James Foley. Uh, what did she mean by that? She meant to say that I was uh, stupid and that, you know, there is nothing in common because they did not behead anybody. But in doing so, she then felt prey to uh, the fact that she was uh, proselyting uh, criminal activity. And that led to the fact that she, uh, she is now losing her immunity as a member of the European Parliament for that, and she can be sued in France for that. So whenever my name in mention is mentioned, she's unhappy. And when Macron quoted me uh, during the last debate after he said, you know, the jihadist wants you to be elected, and that is what Kepel wrote this very morning, uh, then she changed the subject. And I don't know if she lost the debate because of that. Allahu <laughs> a'lam fi amrihi. Okay, one, yes. Uh, now, um, and I also dealt with, uh, I think, some of your questions uh, with that. Now, uh, are we uh, going uh, into a jihad 4.0 well, probably we're going to see something new because uh, my belief, I may be mistaken and uh, we don't have to rush to conclusions, but uh, my belief, as I, as I mentioned briefly in the, um, in the, when I made my remarks, was that 
this 3G uh, jihadism is now facing some uh, uh, difficulties and, and drawbacks because, you know, as opposed to 9-11 where people were very well trained, uh, you know, they just did everything as they were uh, trained to do uh, on 9-11. Uh, now a lot is left to the to individual initiative. There is a global ideology. Uh, there is uh, coordination. But to a large extent, you, you, you can decide who is your target. Like, But, you know, this issue of taking a knife and stabbing people, uh, it already happens. The uh, so we we are not sure about the Nice uh, truck attack for the time being. There is no evidence that uh, Mohammed Lahwej Bouhlel, who the, was the truck driver, was uh, uh, was socialized uh, into uh, ISIS networks. I mean, he was diagnosed uh, uh, psychotic already when he was in Tunisia. This is why he got a visa to France so easily, probably. Then uh, he. Uh, in Nice, where you have a very strong Tunisian community, where jihadism developed very early on because, uh, as I mentioned with this Arab upheavals thing, the fall of Ben Ali, the dictator, led to the fact that as early as uh, February 2011, jails were emptied from all political prisoners in Tunisia, including the jihadists, who could organize very quickly, and they had very strong networks in Nice. This is why the, the French Riviera was the second next exporter of jihadists to uh, the Levant after Saint-Saint-Denis, after the, the quintessential value of Paris, um, because of, the, of, this, of those networks. So um, we, he, was, he was a sort of violent man, uh, bisexual uh, uh, guy who would uh, go to the nightclubs and everything. So didn't behave, as you know, by, by, by the Salafi ethos, if I may say, if I may say so. And now, did he experience some sort of crisis in, in his life? Probably. But then, you know, living where he lived in Nice, he was surrounded very easily by this sort of Salafi environment, which was so easy to, to grab. And it's not only that he decided one day to rent a truck and drive it into the crowd, but, you know, there was already this, this sort of... Um, intellectual, if I may say so, or a radical environment that was floating again around him and that provided him the means. Uh, when the, the priest, uh, Father Jacques Hamel, was stabbed, he was stabbed by a, by a young Kabyl guy who spoke no Arabic originally, who had tried to go to Syria twice, who was arrested, put in jail for a year in a cell where he was with a senior uh, uh, Arab uh, uh, in ISIS. He, who, t who taught him Arabic, so you can learn Arabic you can, in French prisons very well, because he pled, I heard him pledging allegiance to the caliph in faultless Arabic, and he didn't know a word. And then, you know, took the, how do you say, the ceramic knife? Mm -hmm. Did you, you say that? The na no, there's a type of knife. Say it again. A serrated knife? A serrated knife? I don't know what it is. No, it doesn't matter. A knife, a knife. It's a small knife, you know, to just uh, to peel vegetables. And, um, and then took it and killed... Uh, the poor priest who lived a, a block away, you know. So, but the guy, you know, had nevertheless been prepared. There was some sort of um, of brainwash environment, some sort of subculture. So, I don't know whether there's there's a significant there's a difference whether this is already present in. Uh, so, but nevertheless, I'm sure that the challenge now, if we f you follow this idea that you know, they have a challenge, i.e., how to mobilize the masses. And it does not work. So they have they have to uh, get better. The back. Short sure. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Mic working. No, but go ahead. We'll 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 interpret. Thank you. 
Okay, got it. Okay, got it. Okay, should I? Well, thank you. I, I did not um, tackle this Islamic Islamist issue as uh, that you very aptly brought up, and it was part and parcel of the debate in France, because Fillon, who was the the spokesperson for the um, uh, for the right, uh, wrote a book uh, called um, what is it? Uh, Vaincre le terrorisme islamique, or something like that, and. Uh, to defeat the Islamic terrorism. And he, he was accused of lumping together Islamist and Islamic and Muslim in order to sort of uh, to steal part of the Le Pen constituency, right? And, uh, uh, well, he, he lost for also for other reasons. And Macron precisely is very keen to make the difference between Islamist and Muslim. But then... Is the general public able to understand? This is complicated. I mean, everybody in France uh, no, knows Muslims in their environment. It's not like like America. I mean, uh, you, you you see uh, women with veils everywhere in, in French in French streets, and uh, this is this is an important issue. The two minutes now to to uh, go back precisely to the gentleman's question. Uh, you know, I guess that Saudi Arabia is clearly now the big issue. Maybe this is why President Trump goes there next week. And uh, Saudi Arabia is caught in a terrible quandary. Uh, either they, they sort of engage into tremendous reform, or they, be, they may be, uh, they're on the back of the tiger, as you said, they, they may be the, the first victims of the backlash. The apostates will be, quote unquote, will, be, will suffer before the kuffar, before the infidels. And um, this is precisely what people, uh, you know, uh, like Mohammed bin Salman, uh, the king's son, and others are trying to engineer now. But how can they dispense with uh, Wahhabi and Salafi legitimacy? Because this is what brought legitimacy to the ruling family. So is, can the ruling family still be qualified to be in power without that kind of backing? But, never, but the same token, this backing now backlashes because people who have been brainwashed by the Wahhabis say, you're not a good Muslim. Just a, a small footnote, and I believe that you know, this has taken into a much broader context, which is the issue of oil prices. And uh, since I came to America uh, last week, I learned one word in English, which is better than usual, which is fracking, which is not a four-letter word as far as I understood. It has, it, because it happens in Texas, and um, of all places. And, but the, uh, so the price of fracking is uh, now so going down to $40 a barrel, more or less, uh, from what I hear is going to go there because of uh, technology improvements and so on and so forth. This means that the rise of oil prices do the supply and demand thing is not going to happen anymore as it did in the past. And this is going to put tremendous limitation to petro monarchies, which, which range from Saudi Arabia to, the, to Russia, of course, right? And um, this, is, this is a big issue. I think this has to be put in the picture. And Wahhabism was a sort of adjacent to, you know, you could make a sort of parallel um, uh, figures of oil prices and Wahhabism because one was, was helping the other. Now that the oil, they make it, uh, so, so the, maybe the essence, is, is the essence of the fracking. <laughs> I'll, I'll just add one note on that, uh, on Saudi Arabia, which I, personally, I wonder whether there isn't an inverse relationship between the kind of domestic reform that uh, the deputy crown prince seems to be advancing and the external fomentation and spread of Salafi ideas, um, because it seems to me that the more concerned you are about uh, reform at home, the more you might need to demonstrate your Salafi credentials by spending that money to spread the ideology abroad. And it's, in fact, Saudi's external role in spreading Salafi interpretations that has generated the forces you're describing in the book. It's not what they've been doing internally so much. 
So do you worry that, in fact, th th that problem could get worse rather than better? I'm going to table that, that question for a moment because I want to make sure we get to people in the audience. Right back here, please. Thank you. William Zarkin from, from SAIS, Bienvenue ici. Merci. Uh, we owe you a good uh, debt for bringing to our attention Asuri, uh, in, in much more broadly than the translation that was made a couple years before into English. Uh, but uh, how about the jihadis? Uh, is he well known? Is he cited among jihadis? Uh, there there are uh, uh, taps on his, uh, uh, on his website, but uh, is, is he directly uh, uh, cited, for example? And then the other question was, uh, you pointed out, I think very usefully reminded us, that uh, jails are incubators of jihadism. And yet we have a uh, rather uh, exceptional case where the Gamal Islamia in, in uh, Egypt uh, renounced violence uh, while it was in jail. <laughs> what did we do right in that case, and can that be repeated in dealing with the jails? Should I address this issue? Right? Okay. Thank you. As far as Suri, you know, it's not an issue of no one reads books anymore. It's no one knows who are the authors of the books. And uh, this is part of, the, you know, the, the, the we think of it as a Kulturkampf in France between uh, someone who's known as Oli Roy here, his name is Olivier Roy and myself. And he says, you know, no one reads Suri. And, it's, and Arabic is not important because he doesn't know the language. And, the, um, and uh, no one, uh, very few people quote Suri, but they, uh, Suri was sort of minced and... Uh, and disseminated through tweets and whatever. And this is part and parcel of this environment. Even though very few people, I mean, I'm sure that, you know, uh, the guy who drove the truck into the crowd in Nice had never heard about Suri, right? But it does not matter because th those ideas were disseminated. Yeah? And we live in the digital age. Uh, now, um, the jail issue, it's, it's very interesting because, you know, uh, my students who were, uh, who work in, in, the, in the jail system and uh, see that there is a big debate, for instance, between uh, Nostra uh, prisoners and ISIS prisoners in, uh, in, the, in the jail system. And um, on the issue, particularly now, because they are in a phase of weakness, as was the case in Egypt, exactly by the time when, what you, that you mentioned, and some are tempted to find a way for, for a truce, right? which I believe uh, says enough that as of now, they think that the, uh, the omens are, uh, are, are not uh, very positive for the jihadists. That we, as I mentioned, I believe that, you know, there are a number of signs that uh, say that the, um, uh, they, they are now, um, they're looking for something different. I mean, they're, they're in a phase of weakness. They're, they're not going to be on the go on being head on on the offensive as they were because this is going to lead to the fact that they're going to be destroyed. And this is, you know, comes always comes back to the sort of phase of strength, phase of weakness. The prophet, when he was weak, fled Mecca to Medina, because otherwise the community of the believers would have been destroyed. And when he was strong, uh, when he was in Temkin, he, f he uh, came back uh, victorious to, to Mecca. And this is something, you know, they think, the, they think about the world this way, like... Uh, when they defeated, the, when they thought they defeated the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, that they had become the zeitgeist of the, the modern world, they saw the Soviet Union as the reenactment of the Sassanid Empire that had been downed by the successors of the Prophet. And when they turned against against America, they thought of it as you know the raids against Byzantium. America was the Byzantium of today, and the te the very term al Ghazwatayn and Mubarakatayn, the two blessed raids. These were the very terms that were used for the raids against Byzantium. Now, Tamara, you asked something, but then I forgot uh, about Saudi it. Saudi Arabia's uh, proselytization. Yes, yeah. y y but nevertheless, you know, in Saudi Arabia, the, the whole system was uh, function on this same process. It was not only for export. It is for export now, uh, and it is for export also against the Iranian influence, and again, the, what they call the Shia crescent. Uh, but... Uh, you know, it backlashes against them at home. And the Saudis have already experienced, I remember I used to go there a lot in 2003, 2004, when they had threats. And I remember the Minister of Interior in Riyadh was surrounded by 
by roadblocks and everything. There had been attacks against them. So they would uh, bite the hand that had fed them. And uh, they would s those guys would say the Saudis are not really uh, uh, Muslims and Salafists. They're just, they, they worship the, the barrel and the dollar, which are two, uh, uh, you know, uh, into kuffar deities. They're not uh, Allah, they're the one and only. Right up front. Bonjour. Uh, I'm uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sylvia Szawowska. I'm the Polish Assistant Defense Attaché. Uh, thank you very much for Nobody being does. here. <laughs> uh, just wanted to ask you uh, quick questions. First of all, uh, do you, uh, you said, you know, from what I got is that you believe that uh, the French police and European police are much more capable now and uh, to to. Um, uh, let's say, uh, foil the attacks. Mm -hmm. But uh, as the campaign, uh, counter Daesh, counter ISIS campaign is approaching this phase of uh, uh, of targeting the towns and uh, possibly collateral damage will be a huge issue. Do you think that uh, it will fuel somehow the, uh, you know, the Daesh propaganda and incite certain people in Europe to uh, to conduct attack as a, as a kind of a revenge. And the second question is w what uh, I was really shocked by what you said about the French uh, intergovernmental interagency dialogue. Uh, what's what the whole... Matt, uh, yeah, yeah, Matt, yeah uh, and what Matt, before there was one event, he told us about um, understaffing in Molenbeek uh, of the police. Uh, what would be your advice, you know, how we shall cooperate in Europe if even within one country it's not always working so basically you know france and belgium that the, these examples are well known uh, sure. that the cooperation wasn't working and the third quick question what would you advise monsieur uh, uh, le president macron in terms of <laughs> dealing with the uh, well, bon, le banlieue and other god only you. knows again but the in in, uh, in lake france but the um, the the fall of mosul or of raqqa i think I'm not sure it will have tremendous consequences because now you know it, it is, it's in the, it's in the software or whatever. People are now they know that Mosul will fall, and it will be a trial by Allah uh, against uh, some who sinned. You know, and this this is why I insisted a on this will by uh, my uh, tormentor uh, uh, Rashid Qasem. The fact that the guy uh, says you know it's we're doomed. We have to, uh, our time will come later on. And this is also, this was what, in Suri's text, Suri writes, he's on the run, you know. He will be um, arrested by the Baluchis a few months later, who will sell them to the Americans, who will then deal with them. Is it Diego Suarez or Diego Garcia? The Amer Garcia. Garcia. In Diego Garcia, Suarez is the Brits. And then he would be sent to um, Bashar al-Assad in the famous rendition policies, right? and then disappears sometime in 2011, probably when, together with all the other radical Islamists, he was freed from those jails in order to seed, you know, havoc within the ranks of the rebels. Uh, but, um, and he, he was very pessimistic at the time. He said, you know, we have to find a new phase because phase two has failed. So I haven't seen the Suri of phase four to some extent, right? But being a Hegelian, I believe there are only three phases, and then you have a whole cycle that uh, that starts again. <laughs> um, so, as and I, I wanted to, this is in, in terms of you know uh, the sort I don't know in French was it penser en silo? I mean, you know, you have uh, parallel thinking. Ne uh, the cops don't talk to the, co in the cops. The cops don't talk to the military. The military don't talk to the diplomats. All loathe. Uh, academics, of course, who hate them, and then uh, and so on and so forth. Macron uh, addressed this issue very clearly because Macron is a very strange person. You know, he's 39. He thinks at lightning speed, doesn't sleep much. I mean, he used to uh, two years ago. He would call me at one in the morning for 45 minutes, and you know, this is the type of man that's not usual in, in French politics. And um, the. Uh, one thing he said immediately, among other things, because I, you may remember, we, we came here a, a year ago with a colleague, a year and a half ago. I was writing a huge reports for uh, the French state on, you know, the terrible fate of uh, Islam and Arab studies in the country, how to fix it, and, you know, making a sort of, seeing what was happening everywhere. 
And uh, so Hollande and Valls praised the report, but then it was given to senior civil servant who killed it immediately because they saw competition in that, and, you know, academics should be uh, sent to the zoo, and uh, that's it. Now, uh, we discussed that with Macron a lot, and uh, actually he was, he was furious at this thing, the, the, the way the, uh, this had been, been dealt with, the, by, by typical of the Hollande administration. And uh, the first thing he decided on those issues was that he would create a CT task force in the Elysee Palace bringing all those, um, you know, senior civil servants together, under which authority is still unclear now because he's, he spends uh, 84 hours per day dealing with the, the, the legislative elections, which are, uh, otherwise he will have no majority. But clearly to him, uh, and he's known, he was Secretary General, Vice, uh, whatever, Deputy Secretary General of the Elysee Palace, so he knows how, the, how those things work. And um, um, one of his, the key issues, because he considers that terrorism is not an issue of security. You know, it's, as you said, it's something that tells a lot of things about the, the ailments and the ills in society. So you have to deal with the security issue, of course, because it's an issue of French lives. You have to deal with the prison issues, which is broader. broader. You have to deal with, ed with the education system, which does not allow people to create jobs. And then you have to, to deal with the labor market. So he has a very inclusive approach. Now, is it going to be incremental or not? I don't know, because it's his first day in office, or first day and a half. But um, definitely, uh, he probably listened to math in, a, in his dreams maybe and uh, and uh, he uh, he saw that th this this issue that you mentioned is very important for us and he wants this is something he wants to fix clearly whether or not he'll do it we'll <laughs> see but at least it's been it's been said and to say that in the French context is not for someone who campaigns and uh, who, who needs the support of the senior civil servants it's not easy but I think I think he's um, you know, uh, he, he will he will stick by his word. I mean, he's uh, he's not interested in uh, he, he's there to change to change everything. Move the mic to the here. Lift up your hands; so they can see where we're going. There you go. Hello, uh, my name is Judith Clausen. Um, I uh, am a fellow at the Wilson Center uh, this year. Otherwise, a professor at Brandeis University. I was wondering if you could. Um, Tell us uh, what you see about the in the future about the um, relationship between the Islamic State and Al Qaeda. Uh, for years, we have seen uh, now, since uh, particularly since 2014, the Caliphate working as a, a lightning, um, um, a, a real um, attraction for a lot of people who were not uh, particularly just sort of sitting around, not doing too much, but then it became very easy to go to the Islamic State and it was something everybody could do. And we saw a dramatic increase in the number of people. I think reports out of France are something like 12,000 people who are on the watch list. Um, what, will, what, what, what do you see the future? You mentioned, uh, you alluded to the control problem, um, but uh, with the Islamic State uh, losing control of territory, um, we're looking at a very different... Uh, uh, phase uh, in terms of the way attacks are going to be organized and 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 delivered. Uh, so uh, obviously, I think we can agree that we have a huge amount of coordination that goes into an attack like the one uh, the Franco-Belgian network carried out in in Paris Better and then fun, later yeah. in in in, uh, in Belgium. Uh, and and so we have a mix of. of different types of attacks, but I don't think we can rule out uh, more of this that type of highly coordinated attacks. And certainly here in the United States, most people think that Al-Qaeda is far from dead. So I was just uh, wonder what, what, what your okay. views are on that. Thank you. Well, you, you covered a lot of ground, so I may not be able to to answer everything, otherwise Matt uh, will. Uh, I will. I, okay, so I, yeah, I'm very, I'm very fearful of him. Is, is Al Qaeda dead, and what's the future for? The no, future I think, I them? think that you know, the, uh, Al Qaeda has lost momentum, but it's still around, you know. And I would not. It's been complicated to me to say when they lose momentum. Some somewhere around 2005, when, but when Al Suri writes his book. It's not entirely new either. He makes a theory of things that have started to happen, you know. And uh, for instance, the attacks on London in July 2005 
are claimed by Zawahiri. There's a video where you know where uh, it's uh, inter whatever interlapses or whatever. You have the guy, what's his name, uh, Said something, this Pakistani cricket uh, and fish and chips educated uh, British Pakistani. Uh, then who says this is war and I'm a fighter. Uh, with the Midlands accent, and then Zawahiri says, Allahu Akbar, this is uh, everything. So, this looks like it contradicts the top-down phenomenon, because it's, it's not entirely organized from the outside. It's not like 9-11, but nevertheless, they reach out to grassroots people, right? They don't send Saudis to, uh, to in, uh, in a plane onto Westminster Abbey. They, 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 they send uh, Pakistan, lo local... Uh, British-born Pakistanis into the subway and, uh, and the and, and London Transport Authority system. So this is it. There is a, some sort of overlapping, but then I believe that this is the sort the the network-based uh, Suri advocated model that will ultimately uh, be the uh, the key issue to understand what takes place from the 2005. Um, a 2015 uh, 10-year period, as opposed to, to the Al-Qaeda issue. Nevertheless, you still have the Zawahiri and the Bin Laden's son made a statement or something. I guess they feel that now the, the third generation jihadism is sort of uh, losing steam uh, because of the failures in, in ISIS and in, in, on IS territory and um, the fact that for they were totally incapable to take the French elections hostage in spite of 239 dead uh, the, the year before, year and a half before. So they're still around. It's not, it's not as if, you know, you, you had a, a phase that stopped and another one that begins. Because a number of people moved from al-Qaeda to, uh, to ISIS in Syria, but some remained in al-Qaeda. And in our jails in France, uh, there is a strong uh, antagonism between both. And once they wanted to regroup all the all the jihadists in special units, so that they would not proselytize. But then it created, you know, real um, special se seminar sessions uh, between them, and they would, you know, create a counter power in the prisons. And uh, but the Al Qaeda people do not want to be in the same cells as the ISIS people, because they know it's gonna it's gonna turn out badly. So they're, they're still. Um, some sort of competition, even though ISIS has the strongest hand for the, for the time being, but they are the ones who are under duress. And the Al-Qaeda people say, you're under duress because, you know, you just take tremendous risks, because you failed, because you, you didn't. But uh, I'm, I'm not sure that this will uh, mean that uh, Al-Qaeda will rejuvenate, and I, I guess. You know, it, it's a, something that, it's a model that traces back to the pre-digital age. It's, it's pre- uh, it's pre-YouTube, <laughs> which is the key issue in this country, isn't it? It's an excellent question, by the way, that at the Institute we've been grappling with for a while. We held a, an off-the-record uh, conference on this, uh, and the uh, written findings uh, edited by our own uh, Aaron Zellin, who's hiding in the back, should be coming out within the next few weeks, uh, inshallah, answering the question, uh, whither al-Qaeda? Last question, Liz, up front, please. I'm Elizabeth McCorder. I'm with the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee. Um, I know you've touched upon this in your book. I haven't read your book. So if you could just um, touch upon the complexity of working with uh, the Islamist groups and whether that is uh, counterproductive to undermining the ideology. Um, it strikes me as maybe working with white supremacist groups to undermine a Dylan Roof type ideology. Is, is it comparative or is it worthwhile to engage with the Islamist groups in order to do that? Well, this is the word I, wa I was uh, watching out for, for to say whether you would use it. Uh, working with is one thing, engaging is something different. And as far as I understood, the Obama administration and, uh, and, and, and some of the British administrations also were very keen on engaging uh, Muslim brothers and engaging Islamists and engaging Salafists to a large extent, thinking that, you know, and this is also a policy that someone like Olivier Roy favors, say that you have to saturate the Islamic field, have as many Islamists, have as many uh, brothers and as many Salafists as possible, so that there will be no jihadists, they will have no 
no room, you know, because um, um, I am not convinced, to use a euphemism, that this policy has proved any, any results, has, uh, has, pr uh, has led to any significant results, right? And uh, I would uh, rather that, you know, as academics, uh, we, we analyze uh, what is at the root of the ideology and expose it. I think exposing is more important than engaging. Then, if security uh, agencies have to engage for their own reasons, th that's their problem. It's, uh, but uh, publicly, uh, I think, you know, you shouldn't shun your values then they, they are not necessarily criminalized, as Matt said, but they, they can be discussed and criticized. And if not, we do not, have, we do not have a democratic system. This has been just a taste of what you will find in Tehran, France, the rise of jihad in the West. I can't recommend it highly enough. Please join me in thanking both Gilles and Tamara. Thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful day. Thanks a lot. Allah barak fiq. Thank you very much. <laughs>